नमस्कार वेलकम टू अनदर एपिसोड ऑफ एडिटोरियल माय टुडेज एपिसोड इज ऑन अ सब्जेक्ट दैट आई हैव नेवर स्पोकन बिफोर इन माय लाइफ बिकॉज दिस सब्जेक्ट हैज बीन वेरी प्राइवेट टू मी इट इज समथिंग दैट आई आई होल्ड वेरी क्लोज टू माय हार्ट सो इट्स अ वेरी दिस सब्जेक्ट वॉज वेरी प्राइवेट टू मी सो बट आई एम गोन शेयर सम ऑफ माई पॉइंट ऑफ व्यूज विथ यू ऑन that particular on the particular subject but uh, the topic of the day is uh, mk stalin comes in defense of his son he says bjp is spreading wrong narratives about udayanidhi's uh, speech so let's talk about it let's get right into the show so uh, after a long silence Stalin has come out in defense of his son Udayanidhi. Now, what Stalin says is, listen, you know what he says? Bharatiya Janata Party is spreading a lot of wrong narrative. In fact, he went on to say that he, that is Udayanidhi, never used the words genocide in either Tamil or English. Still, lies were spread, claiming so. If Bharatiya Janata Party needs any further explanation regarding what the minister spoke, they should go consult RSS Chief Mohan Bhagwat. So this is what he said. He went on to say that it was disheartening to hear from the national media that Prime Minister Narendra Modi, during a meeting of ministers, had mentioned Udayanidhi's remarks needed a proper response. The PM has access to all the resources to verify any claim or report. So, is the PM speaking unaware of the lies spread about Udayanidhi or does he do so knowingly? Stalin went on to say that Prime Minister who failed to fulfill any promises was attempting to divert attention by invoking the Sanatana. He said, neither the Prime Minister nor his ministers has replied to issues like Manipur to the 7.5 lakh crores worth irregularities highlighted in the CAG report but conveyed a cabinet meeting on Sanatana. Can these leaders truly protect the backward caste, scheduled caste, tribal people, upliftment of movement? Stalin went on to say that India Alliance seems to have rattled Modi who has been proposing one nation, one election policy out of fear. F Stalin further hitting out at the Uttar Pradesh government for not acting against Ayodhya priest who offered a bounty on Udayanidhi's head but filed cases against the minister. So he said, how fair is this? How fair is this that... Uh, you know, uh, you are you are file, filing suit against my son, the minister, but uh, you are not, uh, you know, filing any kind of police complaint against the, the priest who said that, uh, you know, give, give me the head of uh, Uday Nidhi, I will give you 10 crores. Okay. Now, DMK president also went on to say that uh, leaders like Periyar, Mahatma Phule, Ambedkar, Narayan Guru, Vallar and Vaikuntar had spoken out against regressive Varnasrama, Manuvad, and Sanatan ideology, which justified discrimination on the basis of one birth and the oppression of women. Now, uh, before I get to my analysis, let me also get, tell you one more interesting thing which uh, uh, Stalin said. He said, notably a governor, which he is referring to his own governor, that is Tamil Nadu governor R. N. Ravi, has openly supported child marriage and claimed his own marriage was a child marriage. If we initiate legal action against those who conducted child marriages, he defends them and lays stumbling blocks for the investigation. This is what he said. He went on to say that Udayanidhi spoke against such oppressions, ideologies and called to eradicate the practices based on those ideologies. He asserted that DMK's motto of one clan, one god, Let's find that God in the happiness of the poor. We have promoted our ideology through enlightenment, eschewing violent means to achieve our goals. If the BJP believes that they can tarnish the reputation of long-standing party like DMK, they, have, they will find themselves sinking in quicksand. Okay. So these are things which Stalin said. Now, um, I have spoken about this earlier 
uh, once. I, I did an editorial on this particular subject once before, a couple of days back. The reason I am doing this editorial again or I am I'm covering this topic again is because as a channel, as HW News Network, our identity, the reason we exist is because we wanted to talk about religious tolerance, social harmony. That's why we were there. We went through raids. Our journalists were arrested. All because those girls went there and spoke about how one particular community was troubled. They spoke about that. They had to go and go to jail. With our limited resource, we fought our case and we stand in front of you. With our limited resource, we still run this, this channel and I am there in front of you every night at 10 p.m. The only thing that is keeping us going is the fact that we are contributing whatever little, but we are contributing to bring about religious harmony, to talk about religious tolerance. You see, the same vigor and the same way we spoke, spoke about that particular incident in Tripura about the minorities, that same vigor I want to talk about today when a majority or a religion is questioned. See, religious tolerance is religion agnostic. Any religion you go against, it is against religious tolerance. Any religion you go against, it is communal. Okay. This is point number one. <clears throat> My point number two. My point number two is uh, a lot of people I heard, I followed, I used to read. A lot of people I realized change definition, mm. definitions to suit an environment. So if a particular environment hints you or wants you to, to mold a definition to suit that environment or to suit that audience, a lot of people do that. A lot of people do that. And I was shocked to see so many definitions of Sanatan Dharma therefore floating. And each of these so-called experts carving their definition according to which audience they wanted to put that definition to, which I felt very strange. See, I am not a proponent of Sanatan Dharma. I, I don't know anything about Sanatan Dharma. But what I am going to do today is I am going to talk on a few points. I am going to put up a few definitions which are globally accepted. And then let us look at a lot of the narratives that has been spoken about recently and then you decide whether you find the narrative right or these definitions right. You see, the point is, according to Britannica, according to Britannica, Sanatana Dharma is defined as in Hindu term used to denote eternal or absolute set of duties or religiously ordained practices incumbent upon all Hindus regardless of caste, class or sect. Different texts give different lists of duties. But in general, Sanatana Dharma consists of virtues such as honesty, refraining from injuring living beings, purity, goodwill, mercy, patience, forbearance, self-restraint, generosity and Asceticism. Sanatan Dharma is contrasted with Swaya Dharma, one's own duty, Swaya Dharma, or the particular duties enjoyed upon individuals according to his or her class or caste and stage of life. So, this is what Sanatan Dharma stands for. See, Sanatan Dharma focuses on virtues of honesty. Virtues of not harming another life. Virtues on being pure. Virtues of having mercy. This is what Sanatan Dharma stands for. 
The point is when a lot of people who define Sanatan Dharma defines the Dharma, it focuses on something called as Swadharma. Swadharma is part of Sanatan Dharma where they say that regardless of your caste, class, sect, you have to do your duties. Now that's what later went on to be defined as Varna Vyavastha, so on and so forth. But please understand the concept of Sanatan Dharma. Sanatan Dharma is a grand old Dharma. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years back. Some people dated back to 4000, some 7000. At that point in time, one normally saw a village economy. Every village wanted to be self-sufficient. It was a village economy because between one village and another village, there was a large distance and normally this distance was forest. So traveling was almost life-threatening. So every village wanted to be self-contained and for which it was important for the village to have a doctor, important for the village to have a carpenter, important for a village to have a cobbler, important for a village to have a priest, important for a village to have a teacher, so on and so forth. Now, imagine 7000 years back, there were no universities and in a village structure, a university is not possible either. So there was no university and therefore, who is the best person to teach another person his profession? The best person to teach medicine to uh, another person is the father to his son because that's the best person for a son to learn the profession from. So a doctor taught his son to be a doctor or his daughter to be a doctor. A cobbler taught his son to be a cobbler. A, 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 a teacher taught his, uh, his, his children to be teachers. So that's what it is. This ensured that that village is self-contained. And one fine day the village doesn't see, uh, it doesn't become doctorless or cobblerless or carpenterless or potterless or priestless. This is why the concept of Swadharma was priest practiced in Hinduism. Now it's a different issue. It got metamorphosized. It got metamorphosized where the Brahmical society was, was formed to, you know, rule over others, to, to, to oppress others. All this happened. But that was not Sanatan Dharma. Swadharma was horizontally distributed. The duties were horizontally distributed. Nowhere, nowhere in the, in, the, in the religious books is it said that a cobbler was viewed any lesser than a priest. Nowhere in the religious books. In fact, to the contrary, which I will come to. The point is, it was horizontally distributed. It is later on. Like I said, when we got metamorphosized, that horizontal became vertical. Then you had the Brahmins on the top and the Shudras on the bottom. That was later. That was the metamorphosis. Do not view both as one, you have to view them separately. This is what was manifested. That is the original. You view the Dharma for what it was, for what it was made and not what it is. What it is, is a metamorphosized form. So because of a metamorphosized form, because you have not practiced it right for all these years and decades and centuries, are you going to blame the Dharma for it? Are you talking about eradication of the Dharma? How fair is that? While Brahmana was seen as or, or, or regarded as special as a priest class possessing spiritual supremacy by birth, as a special manifestation of religious power and as bearer and teacher of Veda, Brahman have often been taught to represent an ideal of ritual purity and social prestige. Yet, this has been challenged either by competing claims of religious authority, especially from kings and other rulers, or by the view that Brahmana is a status attained by the depth of learning, not of birth. Brahmana is attained. You become a Brahman because you learned, like you become a doctorate, PhD because you studied. It is not because you were born doctor. You studied doctorate. This was metamorphosized. This is exactly what I am saying. 
Now, to prove my point about the metamorphosis is, you see, Veda, Rig Veda, for instance, was supposed to be 1000 to 1500 BCE. Upanishads, 500 to 700 BCE. Manusmriti, 200 to 300 BCE. So, look at how things have changed. From Veda, which is 1500, to a Manusmriti, which is 300 BC. So, there has been metamorphosis. Now, the second point about people saying that, oh, Veda is different to Sanatana and Sanatana is different to Hindu and all that. Listen, a normal Hindu is not trying to do PhD here. A normal Hindu is trying to be happy in the faith that he or she is practicing. That's the point I am saying. Brahminical society is bad. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Because it's an oppressive society. Because any society that says that one caste or one group of people are on the top, it is, it is, a, it is an oppressive society. But then, Brahminical society is bad. Why are you blaming the Brahmins for it? There are so many Brahmins who are fabulous. Great guys. My point is, hatred to anything, towards anything is wrong. Creating enemies out of anybody, any sect because they belong to that sect is wrong. Regardless, regardless of what sect, whether it is minority, whether it is majority or whether it is whoever, that's wrong. And as HW, that's precisely why I wanted to do this editorial again. What is called for? What is called for is religious reforms. Religious reforms. Reforming being in the religion and reforming the religion. Not discarding the religion, not eradicating the religion. Like I said, nobody says no to religious reforms. Everybody, any, any right thinking human being would say rest to religious reforms. Whether Hindu, Muslim, whichever religion, every religion needs religious reforms. Every religion needs religious reforms. And Hinduism is no exception. First, I think religion should be left to religious experts. Politicians getting into religion is something that we have seen how it is degenerating our country. It is not that targeting the minority is bad and targeting the majority is good. It doesn't work that way. Targeting any religion is bad. Keeping religion off politics is the best. If you really, really, really want to talk about religion, if you have a view about religion, please express it. But please express it as a reformist. Please express it and talk about reforms rather than eradication. A. You can't do that. You will not be able to do that. B. You are doing nothing other than creating communal disharmony. If the same thing was spoken as a reformist, as a from a reform perspective, I think Udenidi Stalin would not only have followers in his own state, Udenidhi Stalin would have had followers right from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, including me. Because reforming of religion is always a good act. Putting your point of view is always good. It will be heard patiently. It will be heard respectfully. That's the point I wanted to make uh, in my today's editorial. Uh, Please do write down your comment. Let me know what you feel about it. And uh, till I see you next time. That's uh, tomorrow at 10. Namaskar.